Hello and welcome back to the Kind Human Cycling Show. Today as our guest we have Dan Rivers uh, who is one of the founders of an old bike brand called Thin Blue Line. And Thin Blue Line is actually the first good bike I ever bought. I was about 12 or 13 years old and I worked all summer uh, saving up to be able to buy that. And I, along with a lot of my good friends, we all had Thin Blue Lines, uh, which I in later life came to meet Dan and found out that uh, it was just, uh, it was somebody local who, who was making these amazing bikes. And so welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Gavin. Um, pleasure to be here and uh, I'm looking forward to it. I love to talk about Thin Blue Line. Yeah, so what I like, tell me, I know Thin Blue Line just from a customer from when I came to it, but when did, like, when did you start making the bikes? So um, in the fall of 1991, Terry Porter, I don't know if you know Terry, he works at ACS. He and I were at Interbike together and we were walking around and we walked into the Taiwan area and there was a frame builder called APRO. And uh, they, were, they were like, well, let us give you a quote on frames. So we said, sure. And they quoted us on frames and we were like, wow, I mean, that sounds pretty amazing. So we, uh, we spent the rest of the show shopping for components and we ended up uh, meeting a gentleman from Japan called Katsu Yamaguchi. And Katsu was a Japanese trade agent with contacts with Shimano uh, and a bu bunch of other companies. So uh, he talked to us and it looked like we could build a bicycle at a competitive price, very competitive price, uh, that would be top quality. So uh, we went back, we sat down, we crunched numbers, we, um, we thought we'd spec it with Shimano, but Shimano said no, but that year just happened to be, which if it hadn't happened, it probably wouldn't happen. Suncher was coming out with a group set called XC Pro and XC Comp, and it was, pretty awesome i mean it had grease guard it was micro dry so it was shrunk down um, but it was a, a group that suddenly looked like somebody had something competitive for shimano so we spec the bikes with sun tour and uh, a little risky i think the first year we we did just i think it was like 150 bikes i think we did 100 uh tangy mtb uh, frames and then the uh, tangy prestige frames about 50 of them uh, so we came out uh, we we spec'd them we worked it out we built these bikes and they sold extremely well uh, the uh, interesting thing about that is before we were even had put our first one out Shimano had found out that we were specking with Suntour and Shimano came to us and said hey we want you to use our components on your bikes and we of course said like I mean here we are we're we're kids we, we you know we didn't have tons of money this was a huge project and uh, you know we couldn't afford to jump in right with Shimano at that point in the year and we said well sure like we'll in the future we'll work with Shimano so just by by fluke we were in the business we had uh, dealings directly with Sun Tour and Shimano we kept with Sun Tour for two years, but unfortunately, um, the XC groups had a few little problems, which were, it, it was just uh, the rear cassettes, the cogs would snap off, uh, which didn't happen often, but occasionally, and it kind of gave the group a bad name, and people just wanted Shimano, so our bikes slowly switched to Shimano. But that's, uh, that's how we started. It was just kind of a fluke and uh, it turned out to be a, quite a fun fluke. So that, so that in addition to, to the bikes, you guys already had the bike shop, right? We had the bike shop, yes. We were, uh, and I, I came from a background of, of uh, sort of uh, engineering. In the fall of 1980, I graduated from university and uh, I worked uh, with a gentleman in sailboat industry and he wanted to open a shop up in Toronto. And I said, well, you know, if you wanted to do it, I would be going to be your partner. So we became partners and opened up Silent Sports in Toronto. Um, 
and uh, with sailboats, well, then it's quickly changed to windsurfing because the windsurfing boom happened. And we got out of sailboats and went into windsurfing and started manufacturing our own windsurfers uh, called FM Custom Sailboards. And they were doing quite well. So it kind of was already into doing stuff ourselves. And we made windsurfing booms and windsurfing universal joints and a bunch of things for windsurfers. Um, but with windsurfing, uh, the better you got, the more wind you wanted. So if it wasn't windy suddenly, we weren't interested in going out on the water. And someone showed up with a mountain bike. So in the mid 80s, I guess about 85, uh, I got my first mountain bike. And we got so into windsurfing. Sorry, there's a little bit of noise here, but it's a, it's a good Friday and it's, uh, I'm working from home. But, uh, but we got tired of waiting for wind. We started riding and then we started organizing rides. And then all of a sudden we had a ride plan, but it was windy and we'd be, oh, well, we have a ride plan. We just started riding. So the business changed from that windsurfing direction to cycling. Um, and uh, just built from there with Thin Blue Line being one of the things because we like to do stuff ourselves. Yeah, I remember like I remember being a teenager coming to the store and from my memory if you turned left it was windsurfing, if you turned right it was uh, bicycles. That's right, yeah. yeah. Eventually though um, we took over the whole store which was about the whole building which is about 20,000 square feet and the, when you walk in the store, 10,000 of it was cycling. Then if you went through the middle, uh, the back whole half was all thin blue line manufacturing and stuff. And then just the front left turned out to be windsurfing. So it really turned into more of a cycling shop uh, while I was there. Yeah. So, yeah. So, then when you guys, so the first year you said you sold about 100 bikes. How many? I think, I think it was 150, but yeah. 150, okay, so 150. How many would you have been selling from like Rocky Mountains and comparative brands of like the big brands? Uh, uh, at the at time? that time, uh, we would have definitely been doing a lot more Rocky Mountains than that. Um, probably, uh, we were probably at Rocky at that time. Rocky was the brand. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was uh, bigger than Specialized or Trek or Giant or any of those brands. Rocky, if your phone rang, if, you, if someone wanted a mountain bike, it was, do you sell Rocky Mountain? I mean, that was that was the brand. And we were lucky enough to have Rocky Mountain. Uh, so I would say we were probably selling 500 Rockies probably at that point. Uh, you know, we had, and we had other brands. We had Specialized. Yeah. We had Specialized. We had Trek. We had Giant. We had, we had all the brands. But... Uh, uh, but Rocky was definitely the number one at that point. Yeah, I remember. So I remember when I bought my TBL, I, I came into the store wanting a Rocky Mountain because that's what the guys that I looked up to at school, they, they were riding Rockies. And yes. I came in and I remember talking to somebody and they said, well, you can get the Rocky Mountain or you can get this Thin Blue Lion. And it was the, the Thin Blue Lion had like better gearing, uh, it was way better bike for significantly less money. Yeah, if you took any component, like like people used to say, well, your frame isn't as good. Well, and you'd say, well, hold on a second. Like, let's compare it to that bike. That bike has a chromoly mainframe and a high tensile steel rear triangle. Then you have a double button chromoly frame and a and a full chromoly rear triangle and better components for i mean like there was no comparison yeah. basically bikes were better value i and i'm a better value kind of guy i can't help it but just the way i am so i've never been that brand name guy like i you know it's, i i don't care about the brand the car i drive like i like to have a nice car but it doesn't yeah. have to be the brand uh, i always believe in always been a value for dollar and thin blue line let us do that and let us do it quite well you know, yeah, so. and I like I actually I would argue that my experience as a teenager with Thin Blue Line has directly impacted what we've done at Kind Human because like that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give our customers as much value as possible. And yeah. after buying your brand and loving it and and seeing how it was actually better than the brand that I'd walked in hoping for. 
I was like, wow, it's just, uh, it's more of my point of view than reality as to what's actually going to be better for me. So, so that was, that was, you are a part of our journey at Kind Human. Well, that's, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm flattered and I'm, I'm proud to have helped out in any way that I can. I, uh, I, I like what Kind Human stands for. I like what you're doing. I like your grassroots approach. I like what you're doing with women's cycling. Uh, I like what you're doing now in the pandemic. I mean, uh, making making interesting videos and having uh, Zoom chats for your customers and things like, things like that to keep people interested in cycling. I think uh, uh, you're doing a lot of the things that we tried to do at the time also in our own way. I mean, uh, uh, when I sold when I sold at a uh, Silent Sports, it was in 2000. Um, I was just working on our first website, you know. So, you know, if if I stayed on and kept going, you know, I I, I wonder where the brand would be today. You, that's uh, but but it wasn't to be. You know what I mean? Like I have no regrets. I I love what I do and I love what I do today and I love what I've done and I, I've been very fortunate. So, so. what? When you left, uh, when you left Silent Sports, why why did the brand fade out? Uh, it takes an incredible amount of passion to build a bike brand, as you know. Um, it, it takes a credit, tremendous amount of knowledge about bikes. Um, just specking every part and component is uh, the average person couldn't imagine. Uh, the number of different bottom brackets you have to choose from to put a bottom bracket in that bike and then picking the right gearing and the right parts and the, the, the rims and wheels and having it all put together is it's a huge a huge job uh that you know it's without passion it's way more work than you can handle so uh when i left the year 2000 bikes were uh, sorry, the year 2001 bikes were already um, figured out and going. So they did 2001 and then they kept it for one more year after that. But I think it was just too much for them to, too much work if you didn't have an investment into it. And as okay. you know, you're invested in kind human and, and it's, uh, it's super important without, without passion, it's it's nothing you know it's uh it's gone and i think every bike brand out there there has to be a ton of passion in it to be there yeah so yeah. so then when you were when you were developing the bikes uh like a lot of people come to me and say oh you you just go to asia and you you pick a catalog and and you do that what what was it really like oh so so i was fortunate in the fact that uh um Canadian and in the late 80s Canada was where all the real mountain bike innovations were coming from global so uh, we had a, a company called Rocky Mountain uh, who was making slanted top tube because all the American bikes had these flat top tubes like a road bike they had certain geometry long chain stays and they, they rode like tanks um, and then this company, Rocky Mountain, out in BC, was saying, "No, no, no! Like, you want standover height, so they want the sloping top tubes. You want short stage, uh, short chain stays, uh, so this bike handles really well." They, they, they really thought about the bike that came together. And then there were some other brands like Brody, who was doing this hand-built, higher quality. Well, Rocky were high quality. Don't get me wrong; they had. Um, Chris uh, Kerf making frames for them. Uh, they had, uh, and then I forget Mr. Bailey's first name, but a fellow by Bailey making hand built frames too. So they had some really top, top frames, but they were more mass market. Uh, Paul Brody came out uh, and he kind of made the top, the head tubes longer, a little more comfortable, but still kept the same sort of thing. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a Brody Romax in 1989, uh, which was. Uh, one of my favorite bikes ever i actually just posted it on instagram uh, just yesterday i think or, or today today i think i actually posted a picture of myself with that bike back in 1989 and uh thanks to you because i went to dig up a bunch of old flyers <laughs> and stuff so i was prepared for this uh and uh the brody was great for some people like i'm not super flexible 
the Rocky was shorter head tube. And we kind of thought, well, they both really have their, their, their good points. Let's try to kind of come to something in between. And that's where the thin line geometry came from. It's basically we built on taking a couple brands that we really like and took the best out of them. Um, very few people invent the wheel. People use ideas and build from it. And, and I know that's what you do at Pine Human too. You, 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 uh, you look at what's out there, you look what you like, and you build from there. And, and, it, uh, and it's, it makes for its own personality, its own flavor. And Thin Blue Line was, uh, at the time, I think was one of the best geometries out there. I think uh, no one could touch it personally, but uh, that's, I, I have my own personal bias, but uh, I love the bites, so. Well, and, uh, given how much time I spent on mine, I'd have to agree with you, so. I love that bike. Uh, well, er, we all know that our bikes are become a part of who we are and our identity. And I, there, there's a passion for a bike that we have as human beings, which I think is unmatched in any other product category around. Uh, we just like, I got an email from a customer today saying, I love, love, love my bike. Have I told you that lately? And my reply was yes. And I never get tired hearing it. So. Yeah. And, and and it's amazing the way you actually bond with a certain bike and it's not every bike i've had a lot of bikes that i that i you know i don't really have that same relationship but there are a few bikes i've had in my life that i'll remember those days and cherish my times on them forever um and uh that brody is one of them uh but you know there's some of the new lines were other ones i had a few co2 maxes and i had a um our road bike, the Lightning. I had a hand built Lightning. I call, we call, I call it a Ricker because Ricker was the welder. But uh, <laughs> you know that I absolutely love the bike. I mean, I, and, and unfortunately, I don't have any of them anymore. But I would love to have had stuff. <laughs> but but it's just when you're in retail, you know what it's like. Everything's everything's for sale. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so your time with um, with making bikes. What favorite memory? Uh, I, I would say, um, my favorite memory probably would be, um, going to the races. I love going to the races I, and I competed, but I loved it when I saw so many of our bikes out there, so many people enjoying them and having fun with them. That actually was probably where I got, would get my biggest kick was just, there's a thin blue line, there's a thin blue line, there's a thin blue line, you know what I mean? <laughs> it made you feel really great that so many people were out enjoying your bikes and riding them the way we designed them, you know, for, you know, performance cycling. And, uh, and that's what, that's what it's all about. As far as the manufacturing goes, um, it was always a, a process in learning. Um, I, I think, uh, I mean, it just kept building and building I, it, over the, of the 10 years that I was involved, we built over 10,000 thin blue lines. And um, it was just uh, an evolution of making it better and easier and less time and, and more efficient. Uh, but it was, it was a group effort. And I can't take all the, uh, all the credit. I mean, Terry Porter was instrumental in helping. Uh, we had a... Uh, a woman working with us named Minerva Lee, and Minerva was uh, absolutely instrumental in uh, the manufacturing and quality and making sure that everything was done absolutely perfectly. Uh, Minerva was a black and white kind of person, and it ha everything had to be perfect, and she was a great addition to our team. Um, and uh, it, But there was a lot of people involved, and I mean, when we started building frames, uh, which uh, turned out to be virtually impossible because you get a person trained welding properly and then you lose them. Yeah. Uh, so I really believe that if you're going to actually manufacture frames yourself, you have to be the person doing it. So that's why uh, a company like Paul Brody could do it because uh, he was building them himself. You know, these little small boutique places, sure, they can do a great job, but if you're depending on other people to do that, 
Uh, unfortunately, in, in the bike industry, it's hard to pay someone what they can get if they go out and use their skills elsewhere. Yeah. So the frame building, we, we did it for a few years, uh, but it just, it just was impossible to do that profitably. And, and, and honestly, like we had uh, the Kerf make CO2 max frames at one time. Uh, our, our, we used Toyo factory in Japan for a few years, which was the same factory that the P series Ritchie bikes were coming out of. Um, you, like we had some top, like our, our titaniums were made by Sandvik, but it was all to our geometry, our spec, our everything. So um, it was, uh, you know, they were our bikes, but I think it was better if you depended on someone who was specialized in that area. But our main mass of bikes came from April, which is a, uh, was a, it is still a high quality manufacturer of frames in Taiwan. Um, but, uh, but the higher end stuff, yeah, we, we used all sorts of really cool companies and dealt with some pretty neat people. So uh, it, was, it was a pretty great experience. Well, that's, uh, that's wonderful to hear. It's, yeah. This has been a real treat for me, being able uh, to walk I'll down. Give, I'll give you one last good, uh, yep. I'll give you one good story here. I was working in the shop one day and I get, someone calls me before I go to the phone and I pick up the phone and it's like, um, hi Dan, it's Tom Ritchie. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, who is this? He goes, it's Tom Ritchie. I go, get out. Like, who really is this? He goes, it's Tom Ritchie. And I'm like, Tom Ritchie, like this, he is like my hero. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's a guy who was building the, the latest uh, cutting edge Komali frames going at the time. Um, and uh, he was wanting to talk to us about specking some of his parts on his bike. I mean, like it was just like some of the, the industry was so small, but it was, uh, it was pretty amazing. You know, it was uh, just, you never know in this industry, yeah. you never know who you're going to cross paths with. That's so. an awesome story. I, as you know, we, we spec Richie parts on our bikes. Yes. And I'm still waiting for the call from him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Tom's probably, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, he's, but he certainly does a great job on parts. I mean, they're, they're still cutting edge, uh, lightweight, quality, uh, well thought out pieces. And I mean, Tom Ritchie definitely didn't sell out. He's kept his, yeah. you know, kept to what he believed in, which was always performance. And uh, yeah, no, he's, he'll always be a hero of mine, that's for sure. Yeah, like we, we share a, a common hero there because he's the yeah. man. Yeah. So, yeah. And, um, yeah, so, yeah, I don't know. Any other questions, I guess? I don't know. Yeah, no, I, like, I think we're out of time for, for okay. the show today. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here with us. And um, just for my own interest, you've given me a lot more insight into something that I thought I knew something about and it's a great example that when we think we know something about something there's always so much more behind it so yeah. thanks for being with us today well, well thanks for a kind human I think what you're doing is uh, is amazing and I hope uh, your customers appreciate uh, what you're putting into it because here you are on a in the middle of a, a holiday uh, spending an hour with me go, letting me have a great time talking about what I love so uh, I love what uh, I do too. So um, thank you for being here with me. Okay. Well, thanks, okay. Gavin. Yeah, have a great day. Thanks. Yeah. Bye.